Welcome to this presentation, which will cover kind of an orientation for the hospitality law course that you're taking. I'm first going to go through a um, PowerPoint presentation, and then we will get a tour of Canvas in which we will uh, look at the syllabus and several other documents to hopefully get you acclimated and feel confident that you know what you need to do to be successful in this course. So let's begin. Um, first thing I guess I want to say is welcome. I'm very excited to be teaching this course. I hope that you are pleased that you're going to be taking it this semester. I'm here to be a resource for you and I hope that you do feel um, that I am here for you and interested in assisting you in any way that I can. Um, this is a little bit of information about me. Here I am. If you see me on campus, I'm that lady right there. Um, my little bit about my background, I've been, I practiced law for about 20 years before I came to work for uh, Colin in 2010. And um, I first worked for a large law firm in Houston and then I went what's called in-house in the legal business. That means I went to work for a corporation. I worked for JCPenney for about 17 years. And most of the time, both at Baker Botts and JCPenney, I worked as a labor and employment attorney. Um, and I also was a litigator at times. I did a little bit of other things too, but those were certainly the main focus of my career. I have been at Collin though since um, 2010, so I've been here for quite a while, and I am a full-time instructor. I also am the discipline lead, which is kind of a, the Collin term for like a department chair. Um, I'm the discipline lead for legal studies, and that's the main department that I work with. Um, I teach paralegal courses primarily, but I I also teach business law for business majors. I teach employment practices, which is a course for HR professionals that talks about employment law. And of course, I teach hospitality law, the course that you're, you're taking. So um, I'm very excited to be pra practicing in this area and teaching in this area. Um, it's uh, an area that uh, it's my second time teaching it. So I had the opportunity to learn about uh, hospitality law last fall. And so I'm hoping to share with you what I've learned and probably learn some more with you as we progress through the semester. My office is on the Preston Ridge, the Frisco campus, in the library building. I am in room L232. My office points towards the quad, in other words, away from the parking lots. I would love to meet you. I hope that you'll find the time to come by and, and we can chat and I can get to know you on a personal level. Also, I'd be glad to help you with um, uh, uh, your resume with questions you have about the course things along those lines I think developing a personal connection with your instructor is a really smart strategy as you progress through your career and um, having that relationship that you can go back to that instructor and say hey this is what's happening with me right now uh, can you give me some guidance in this area so it's always good to build those bridges and I hope that you will take advantage of that I certainly enjoy getting to know students and I look forward to meeting you um, my office hours, by the way, are available in the syllabus. We'll talk about that in a little bit. You'll see that I have both face-to-face -face office hours as well as virtual office hours, so you don't even have to come to my office to have meetings. And then I'm available at additional times beyond those official office hours. This is our textbook. Um, uh, you will need to pick up a copy of it. Um, you can get the a current edition or uh, an edition relatively close in time to, to this one. If you're not sure if the edition that you're thinking about getting is close enough, you're welcome to come to my office hours and we'll sit down and I'll be glad to just let me know in advance. I'll have the book in my office so we can compare uh, what's the table of contents and the contents of the edition uh, that, that you might be looking at versus the one that we're going to be using in this class. It isn't an optional situation. You will certainly need to have the textbook. Um, it is important that you have the textbook, but I would tell you it's even more important that you watch the lectures. I design my online courses a little bit differently than many instructors do. Everything that I would have said in a face-to-face -face class, I say in an online class. I have taped lectures for them all, and they're about as long, some of those are a little shorter, some of those are longer actually, than I, what I would do in a face-to-face -face class. You really, really need to see these lectures. Um, some of the things that I highlight are different than what the textbook highlights, um, 
and sometimes I add information, especially Texas specific information that you just wouldn't be able to find in the textbook because the textbook is a national book. So please don't consider the lectures optional. You really need to read the textbook and watch the lectures, but if for some reason in a given week time is, is on a crunch and you can only do one, be sure to watch the lectures. That should be your higher priority. And then you'll go back and read the textbook maybe the following week or something along those lines. Um, Here's various tools that are available to you with Canvas. If this is your first semester at Collin, you may not have had an opportunity to do things with our um, learning management system. It's a cool one. I think you'll enjoy working with it, but just like any other system, there is a learning curve, and so it's good to spend a little bit of time exploring and finding out the different features of it. So I encourage you to look at some of the resources available at Collin so that you'll uh, be successful in navigating the course. It's always important, if you get a bunch of, I'm going to tell you a secret, <laughs> if you get a bunch of instructors together at Collin or pretty much any other school and you were to ask, what's the one thing students can do that they don't do for success in your course, I would submit to you that probably uh, 70 to 80 percent of instructors would say this is their first answer, reading the syllabus. It's so important, not because the syllabus is such a fascinating document, but it lets the student know where to invest his or her time. So often when I deal with students, they don't know where to invest their time. They may be spending a lot of time on topic X that is worth very few points in the course, and then they don't have enough time to prepare for topic Y, which may involve a great number of points. And so knowing where to invest your time is a big, big secret to being successful in a college course. And uh, the syllabus is your map for that. We'll, I'll go over the syllabus and give you some pointers in that, in that area when we get to that. Another important thing are announcements. I send out a ton of announcements in this course and the announcements will give you information that you will need to be successful in the test. It's not just, hi, how you doing type stuff. It is giving you information that you won't find anywhere else that you need to have for that test. So spend that time so that you can be the success that you want to be on your test. It's important. You'll get your announcements one of two ways. Actually, you could use both of the ways. One is that the announcement will go to your Cougar Mail email address. Some people use that email address all the time, and so you'll easily see that. Other folks don't go to their Cougar Mail that often. That's fine, too. Uh, you just have to be sure to check on Canvas to look at the announcements. I'll show you where to find that later on. It's important to look for those announcements at least once a week, um, probably early in the week if you can and also again to, to look at your, your syllabus and get familiar with that this first week and potentially go back and review these documents. Um, inevitably what will happen is, or at least this is my experience, is that you'll look at the syllabus and you'll have a good feel for what's in it and then several weeks pass or maybe you have several classes and it's so easy to conflate the information from one instructor's syllabus to another instructor's syllabus. So we're in November or December and you just can't remember what my policy is on X, Y, or Z. Well, the wonderful thing is all of the orientation material is just there waiting for you. Just go back and be sure to look at it. I apologize, I should have said this at the beginning, but if you haven't uh, done this, I'm going to suggest that you get some paper and pencil out and take notes because these notes are going to be a quicker way for you to get the information that you need if you do forget it. So what you might want to do if you didn't have your paper and pencil handy is go ahead, get that organized, restart the video and take notes uh, for the things that seem to be of special importance. Take a picture of those or put them on your laptop and uh, identify it in some way so that that can be the first place you look when you have questions about the course, because you inevitably will. That's normal to have questions and it's frustrating when you can't find the answer, but that won't be you because you will have your notes. Um, here's another thing that said, oh, here we go. We'll talk about this in a second. Um, please visit our course at least three times a week. Um, I recommend a Monday or Tuesday and then a Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, and then a Saturday or Sunday. Um, try to be there by at least Tuesday. Uh, usually I should have your assignments graded by Tuesday, and so you can look at your comments, your notes, and also the announcements. Um, also on, by the, on that Monday or Tuesday day, you'll wanna make your first post on the discussion board. We'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. 
Okay, here's, I hate to, to start with this, this sounds so uh, glum, um, but one of the things, unfortunately, one has to do in an orientation is say kind of what you can't do. Um, that may sound a little harsh, but it's actually kind of cruel to be kind, so to speak, because if I don't tell you what you can't do, um, and then you do it because you don't know you're not supposed to, and you don't get credit for it, that's kind of unfortunate. So I'm telling you this not because I want to be mean, but because I want to be nice. I want you to know what you can't do, so you won't need to do it. And the big thing here is I don't accept late homeworks. I don't care whether it's five minutes late or five hours late or five days late. The time is the time is the time. And so if you don't have it in by that time, I'm not going to grade it. Or I will be glad to review it, but it won't count towards a grade. So if it's due at 11.59 p.m. on Sunday night, and that's usually when things are due, I'd go ahead and post it by, say, 8. I mean, in fact, I'd probably give myself 24-hour lead time because you never know when you're going to have an internet outage or something is going to come up in your life. Maybe you get food poisoning, God forbid, or something along those lines. And so give yourself some grace. Be kind to you. Uh, give yourself some, some avenues, some breathing room, some margin in your life so that if something goes wrong, you're okay. It's going to take you the same amount of effort to do it on Sunday night as it would on Friday night or Thursday night. And so if you think in those terms, you're going to be giving yourself some cushion and you're going to be able to successfully submit your assignments. So um, I'm not very impressed by a student who comes to me five and says, well, I, 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 was, I had it done five minutes after the due date. My first question is, why didn't you submit it a day or two before the due date? Even if you had a technical difficulty, you were risking that being late by pushing it to the nth degree, and you lost. You gambled and you lost. I'm sorry, next time make a smarter choice in terms of gambles. So I just don't accept late homework after the date. I feel human compassion for you. We've all been there. This is a learning moment. I also don't remind about deadlines. There's actually a few reasons I don't. One reason is I'm forgetful. I teach seven courses and um, I've got lots of due dates going on in my head. And if I start reminding about due dates and then I forget a due date, you might be expecting me to remind you about that kind of stuff. And so you might kind of reasonably feel like, well, gosh, Grover reminded me about all the other due dates. You didn't remind me about this one. I'm kind of frustrated about that. So one reason that I don't want to remind, I don't want to get in the habit, is I might let you down. The second reason, this is the more important reason, is that um, I have two kids, an 11, 13-year-old and a 15-year-old. And my 13-year-old, I'm constantly reminding about stuff. And that's okay because he's 13, right? I mean, I wish he were more independent, but he isn't, and that's okay. But I'm an adult and you're an adult. And it would be wrong for me to treat you like you were a 13 year old. You wouldn't like it. It would be frankly insulting, patronizing. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to get you in a position where you're frustrated with me because you feel like I'm talking down to you and you rightly would feel that way. And so for those two reasons, I'm not going to constantly remind you about due dates. They're all available to you on canvas. You'll see that there is a pattern to when due dates come up. So it won't be a mystery for you. Um, let's go on from here. Um, please, please uh, contact me, come by my office hours, send me emails. I look forward to hearing from you. Um, I want to develop a connection with you. So even though it's an online course, don't feel like there's this distance between the two of us. I am as close to you, perhaps sometimes even more close to you than if we were in a face-to-face -face class because um, we are in some sense having these private conversations. Just you and me, you're alone in your room, I'm alone in my room, and so we're talking about these things. Let's talk about emails. A um, couple of things I want to start with. The first thing I want to say is let me actually look at Canvas right here. I'm going to flip on over to Canvas. We'll go from slide 14 over here to Canvas. Let me make my Canvas look like your Canvas. Here we go. You'll notice over here this friendly little box. It's called Inbox. And when you have a question come up in Canvas, it's really natural. Um, to think, gosh, I've got a question for Groover. Let me just hit this button right here. Don't do it. Please, please, please don't do it. The reason why you shouldn't do it is because I won't see it. Um, you're, you're just wasting your time because I don't look here. This isn't a box that I um, routinely click on. Instead, send me an email to this address. 
Now, you know, all of your instructors, even the ones who say they don't have quirks, we all know they do have quirks. And this is one of my quirks. I don't use that inbox. Um, I'll explain to you why, but you really don't need to know why. That's just kind of trivia. Um, in most of my classes, on my paralegal courses, I have students who take my course, or my various courses I teach, multiple times, sometimes even the same semester. So I might have a student named Bob, and I had him last semester and the semester before, and I have him in two classes this semester. And so Bob has an issue come up, and he says to me, well, Groover, you told me this uh, two semesters ago, and, and I'm like, well, gosh, maybe I did. And so I want to go back and look at that email pattern. Um, but if, he, if Bob and I had been corresponding through this inbox, I would have to go through all those courses. And maybe I don't remember exactly which semester Bob's talking about, or maybe Bob's confused about the semester, or perhaps um, I don't know which class Bob took. It's going to involve a fair amount of legwork for me. But if Bob sent me emails um, and, uh, to my email address, I will have all of Bob's emails grouped together. And so it will be easy peasy for me to pull those up. That makes my life easier. Now, some faculty members won't do this. They will prefer that you use the inbox. Um, and so you ought to ask your particular instructor what his or her preferences are. I wish I could make this go away. It would make your life easier and my life easier. But um, unfortunately, I don't have that power. So please ignore this box for my class. Go ahead and send me an email. Um, here's some advice about email messages. Uh, I had a, a let me back up saying, um, as a hospitality manager, very likely you are going to be sending lots of emails. Emails to vendors, um, emails to employees, emails to your supervisor, emails perhaps to guests in your facility. Um, and um, certainly when you are seeking employment, you're going to be sending emails out to express an interest in a particular position. So one of the skills that I would like to empower you to develop is being effective with email. It's not really a hard skill to develop, but in my experience, most students haven't been taught how to do this. And so one of the things I want to leave you with is that information. Um, if you leave this course learning very little bit of hospitality law, but you learn how to send in a professional email, this is a win. This is a successful course for you because this can absolutely be the difference between you getting the job, between you getting the promotion. All of the email etiquette, knowing how and when and why to send emails is a huge strategic advantage that you'll have over other people in your particular industry. So let's talk about some strategies. And I'm going to talk about them from the perspective of the academic situation when you're emailing me. But you know what? These skills transfer to the professional world as well. So the first um, email that you want, that, or the first thing that you're going to consider when you're sending an email, the first thing is, is email the right way to communicate this question or this, um, this piece of information? Email is a tremendously useful tool. I use it all the time. But it's not the only tool, and it doesn't do everything well. It would be a little bit like, let's say we were surgeons. Um, I'm guessing here, I'm not a doctor, but I'm guessing if I were a surgeon, I would have had lots of different types of scalpels and scissors and, and various tools that I would use. And a scalpel that's very good at X is probably not very good at Y, and so I'm going to vary what I use. You as a professional need to develop those same skills. Email is going to be very effective in many cases, and it will be very ineffective in other cases. Let me give you a couple of situations in which it's going to be ineffective. One is when you're handling a very sensitive matter. Um, because email is pretty tone deaf. You might think you are communicating delicately, doing it in a sensitive way, but because the reader can't hear your tone of voice, can't see your body language, because there isn't a, a give and take, a flow to the conversation, your recipient may well not pick up on the tone that you meant to convey. It's very, very difficult to communicate those subtle tones in emails. Um, even the best email writer oftentimes fails at that, and it would involve a tremendous amount of time fussing and fretting over every word to get to that finish line. 
It's much, much easier and quicker to have that telephone conversation. So sensitive matters are going to fall like a, a brick when you try to put those in emails. Uh, it's kind of unfortunate because many times people will rely upon emails to handle those sensitive matters, in part because, gosh, it's uncomfortable to talk about those sensitive matters. Email means I don't actually have to talk to that person. And so we use it kind of to dodge the issue. If you're dodging the issue because you're uncomfortable, maybe you're embarrassed, maybe you think that people are going to be angry or they're going to have hurt feelings, that's exactly the time you don't want to use email. Now, you might want to do the email to schedule of the call or schedule the meeting. That's a really good use of email, but it's not a good use to actually try to resolve those types of sensitive issues. So um, in the business situation, you don't want to do that. And if you have a sensitive issue that comes up in, in this class, you want to uh, request some kind of favor from me or something along those lines, um, I'm going to tell you right now, email is absolutely not the way to do it. Um, it's not going to be the most successful path for you by any means. Um, so what should, so, um, so that's one category. Sensitive stuff you don't want to do the email. The second category is um, stuff that requires a lot of the recipient is not email appropriate. A good rule of thumb is if your recipient is going to have to spend more than five minutes on it, or is going to have to write more than three sentences in reply, that tells you you need to have a conversation with this person. Because it's not going to happen. The recipient isn't going to spend, when they, when they get your email, isn't going to jump into overdrive and spend an hour researching your issue. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Maybe if, if you're the, the boss and this is your subordinate, maybe it'll happen. But in the real world, it's just not going to. If you want that person to really, really work hard to get that information, you're going to have to have a conversation. You're going to have to explain there's going to, have to be a give and take. So your goal is going to be frustrated under those circumstances. So think to yourself, am I wanting this person to spend more than five minutes or write me more than three sentences in res response? If that's the case, then you want to um, use or maybe send an email to schedule a time you can talk. I oftentimes get emails where a student has become frustrated and learning is a frustrating thing so I completely get that. Um, they just, they're not understanding something, it seems very muddled and confused and they're not really getting a good grasp of it. And so they might send me a note saying, I just don't understand how alcohol permits work or something like that. A perfectly valid, reasonable thing to be confused about. But that's a pretty big topic. I probably speak, spend several minutes in one of my lectures on that. And um, I'm sure the textbook spends a few pages on that topic. So let's think about it. If several pages in a textbook and several minutes in a lecture haven't clarified the issue for you, how likely is it that you sending me a note saying, explain this to me, how likely is it that my response via email is suddenly going to shine a light on that? Not very, is it? Now, if it's a very discreet question, for example, you say in your video that uh, blah, 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 but is it 17 or 18 or, you know, whatever, something like that. Something concrete like that, maybe I mumbled, maybe I sneezed when I was saying it. That's a good question for email because it's very easy to answer within those five minutes and it would result in a question of less than uh, three sentences. But if you're asking me to kind of represent the material that I present without any more specificity, that's not going to work. What's going to happen is I'll say, okay, be glad to explain to you about alcohol permits. What, what are you confused about? Oh, I put it back in your court. Now you're saying, uh, well, I just don't understand the whole thing. Well, um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. What questions do you have? And we go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Um, and you know what? If you and I, if you had just said, Let's talk for, for five minutes. And we talk in the back and forth conversation. I get your questions resolved in five minutes. It's going to be quicker. Will it be a little bit less comfortable? We have to step out of your comfort zone just to scooch? Possibly. But I promise you I'm not an intimidating person. I like to talk with students. I like to hear what uh, you're interested in, what seems to be a sticking point for you, so I can remove that detour, remove whatever is blocking your understanding. Okay, so we've already kind of decided what email is good for. Email is good for something that's going to either convey non-controversial information, 
also email that is requesting a meeting, or finally email that is asking for a very quick response from the recipient. Those are great for email. So if you decide, yes, email is the right way for me to go in this situation, what is that email message going to look like? Well, your subject line should include two things. Let me flag that right here. Wait a second. Oops. The, the first thing not sure what's happening here. Let's try a different color. The first thing, well, <laughs> the first thing it needs to have is um, it needs to identify the class. Um, as I said, I teach seven classes and um, I will get to know you, I promise, but I may not remember whether you're in hospitality law or employment practices or one of my paralegal courses. And so um, you need to tell me what course you're in. So in your subject line, include the course. It just so happens this semester, I'm just teaching one section of hospitality law. So all you have to do is say hospitality law or HAMG 1340. Either one of those are good approaches, but be sure to include that in the subject line. The other thing is you need to tell me what you're asking about. A question about, um, a question four on assignment for chapter seven. That's a good heading. It is really focusing on it. Or uh, uh, need help finding the statute of limitations for, um, uh, a breach of contract claim in Texas or whatever the particular issue is. Make your subject line very clear. That way it's going to let me know how urgent the situation is. And it's also going to help me see, well, if one person is having this question, it's important that I answer them. But let's say several students are having that same question. Well, that lets me know, wait a second, I probably need to address this not just for the individual student, but for the whole class. So be sure that your email includes both of those things. So how do we translate that into a professional situation? You want to have a very clear subject line that tells whomever you're sending it to what's going on. And especially if this is somebody who isn't automatically going to know that an email from you has to be about this, is you're going to want to include additional information. So let's say you're corresponding with one of your vendors. This vendor might have 50 different clients, and so you'd want to include your name either your name or the business's name on the subject line so that the uh, 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 vendor will know, okay, yeah, this is, you know, happy holiday restaurant that is sending me this, uh, this email. It's going to help the recipient organize that information and uh, make sure that it ends up with the correct person. Um, then you want to have a greeting for the recipient. It's best to be more formal rather than less formal. Uh, very seldom are people insulted when you treat them with courtesy and respect. And they may think it's a little bit cute or maybe over the top or overly formal, but they're not going to be offended. Being too ready with the hi, Bob, or uh, hey, Bob, all that kind of stuff. Uh, some people won't have any problem with it, but there's a fair number of people who'll be like, wait a second, uh, you don't know me. Why are you calling me Bob? I don't go by Bob, I go by Robert, or you know, whatever the particular thing is. So my suggestion is to start emails to, to whomever you're sending it to with a dear, then with a, an offer, honorific like Mr. or Ms. or Professor or Doctor, then the surname, and then of course you're going to use a colon because it's professional communication. The colon lets your recipient know this isn't a, a, a personal letter, this is a professional correspondence. Now, obviously, if you're sending an email to one of your coworkers or even your supervisor, if you have a first name basis with him or her, you're probably going to say, Dear Mary. And so then you would uh, type, for some reason, it's not working. Here we go. I can make it go back. Ah, oh, here we go. So we have Dear Mary. You're still going to want to use the dear. And you're still going to want to use the colon. But if you have a long-standing relation with someone, it's fine to use their first name, even a nickname if that's what they prefer. Now, I probably wouldn't do that with customers. I would stay with the uh, with Gus. I'd stay with the Mr., Ms., or Doctor um, title before their first name. 
Then in the body of your um, email, then you want to explain what your circumstances are. Common things I see here are typos, incomplete sentences, uh, missing words. Uh, but conceptually, probably the hardest thing that I, I deal with is that the student has become frustrated with something, probably very understandably frustrated. And he or she has been trying to get this thing working maybe for an hour or longer and they have lots of experiences lots of emotions invest in this but i'm a stranger to whatever this problem is i haven't been living it and so when they try to explain it to me they use this shorthand they assume i know what they've been going through and so when i get the email i can't really make heads or tails out of it i they say something's not working but they don't really tell me what it is or where i can find this problem so you want to re make sure that it's written in a way that somebody who hasn't been involved in the situation is going to be able to understand it. Um, one strategy for this is to read your email aloud. That will help you see if there's any missing words or any lack of clarity. Another strategy is to have somebody else, somebody who hasn't been involved in the situation, read the email too. Do they understand what you're asking about? A third strategy that can work is to take screen prints of whatever it is you're experiencing. Sometimes, you know, a picture is literally worth a thousand words. So those are some strategies to think through to make your um, email more effective. Now you're doing all of this not because you're a super nice, awesome person, although of course you are a super nice, awesome person. You're doing all of this because of self-interest. Because the more you help the recipient, that allows the recipient to help you. I mean, you're sending the email because you want something from that recipient. And the more you can make it easy for the recipient, the more likely it is that the recipient is going to do what you want the recipient to do. So it really is about informed self-interest. I'm going to give you a little bit of a warning. Um, and that is smartphones are super handy. I love my smartphone. I use it all the time but I don't write emails with it. Because uh, typing with your thumbs, even if you're really, really good, is going to result in typos, miss words, weird abbreviations, uh, almost written in almost like a telegraphic type style. It doesn't allow you the subtlety, uh, the, the shading of meaning, the uh, following all the grammar rules, all those things that you'll want in a professional email. And so my suggestion is don't send emails via smartphones. I mean, to your best friend, to something like that, that's fine. But in a professional setting, to your boss, to a colleague, to your instructor, don't do it. Instead, compose it on a computer, a laptop, a Mac, um, or a tablet, something along those lines. Um, if you have to do it on a smartphone, be sure to really, 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 really read it 10 times. Have somebody else next to you, hey, could you read this for me? And be sure to remove that line that says sent from an iPhone. Because what that communicates to the recipient is, I couldn't be bothered to, 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 to really spend some time on this. Um, I expect you to do a lot of work, but I, you're just really not that important to me. It communicates a super negative message to the recipient. And you don't want to do that because, again, you want to make that person feel motivated to help you out. And that's one of the least motivating things you can do. So if you have to send it by a smartphone, be sure to erase that, any indication of the smartphone sending and of course you'll want to make sure you remove all those typos so that the recipient doesn't figure out you actually did send it from the smartphone so try to be a little bit sly in that area i'm going to flip through some of these as we already talked about this ah this is how the grade is calculated you may recall earlier i said that the syllabus is really the key uh, for you to come up with a road plan as to what you're going to do. You can see here that class participation, which are discussion boards, isn't a very big impact upon your grade. We're going to have a discussion board for every single week. So each one of the discussion board is less than 1% of your grade. So let's say you lose a point on a discussion board. I mean, I understand that's frustrating, but does it have any impact upon your grade? Not at all. Missing several discussion boards will erode your grade, but missing one at the odds of that dropping you a letter grade is very, very small. So the takeaway is invest in things that matter. For one thing, once an assignment is completed, 
there's no reason to worry about that anymore. You can't change it. Even if you lost a lot of points, it's a done deal. So always think forward with your uh, time commitments and also focus on what the bigger weight is. We have two quizzes in this class and we have two tests. Each quiz is only worth 10%. So I ought to spend significantly less time preparing for those quizzes than the midterm. Now you can make an argument that, well, if I prepare well for the first quiz, that will help me prepare for the midterm. Well, that's true. That's a good point. But um, the points on each quiz are worth significantly less than the midterm. So keep this equation in mind as you decide how to invest your time. And once you hit the submit button, that's done move on to the next thing. If you end up taking the, the midterm and you know you bombed it, that's a bummer. I'm sorry. But you know what? You still have the opportunity for another quiz. You have the opportunities for a final exam. There are other assignments and, and discussion boards coming up. So you still have things you can work on uh, that spilled milk once you hit that submit button. And so I encourage you to move on to the next topic. Speaking of next topic, let's talk, talk about the midterm. Um, and this also applies to the final examination. So when you take the midterm, you have a choice to make. You can take the midterm on the Frisco campus in the testing center. By the way, the testing center on the Frisco campus is in Founders Hall on the second floor directly above the bookstore. Or you can take the test in another testing center um, on in, at Collin. Uh, we have a testing center on the Plano campus and also on the McKinney campus. Now I happen to office on the Frisco campus so when I drop off the testing information I will do it to the Frisco campus and so it's a it's a guarantee that you're going to be able to take it on the Frisco campus but I'm going to be candid with you here. At, Sometimes everything works out just perfectly and the, uh, the information gets distributed to the other campuses. But unfortunately, sometimes there's some kind of glitch in the communication from one testing center to another. And so, so, so if you're thinking about taking the test on either the Plano or the McKinney campus, before you go, just be sure to call ahead. Most likely what they'll say is, yep, it's here, come on down. And that'll be great. You'll go ahead and take it at that location. Occasionally, though, you may hear, no, we don't have that. So here are my suggestions as to how to handle it. And I'm going to suggest four strategies for you. The first strategy is politely ask them to recheck. Usually they do actually have it. The person that you're talking to just doesn't know quite where to look. And so sometimes that is all that you need to do to get the issue resolved. It may be helpful, especially if you're talking to a student um, employee, to go ahead and talk to the, um, the manager, the full-time employee who's there. That's one strategy. The second strategy, if the first one doesn't work, is to say, would you mind calling the Frisco uh, Testing Center? My instructor uh, has told me that she has made the test available to the other campuses, and if you could ask them to refax that to you, then I would be able to come in and take the test. That strategy probably will work, if, even if the first one doesn't work. But let's say that doesn't work. The third strategy you can do is actually to call the Frisco Testing Center and say, hey, um, I'm here at the Plano, or I'm, I'm planning on going to the Plano Testing Center, the McKinney Testing Center, and they tell me they don't have the test. Could you resend it? And most likely they'll be glad to do so. So those are three strategies. Again, you probably won't ever need to use even the first one, but one of those three is almost certain to work. But let's say you've tried them all and you struck out each time. No worries you can just go to the Frisco campus. It may involve you driving a little bit farther, but it will be available for you to take at that location. Now, if you want to, after you've tried your three approaches, you can contact me. But I wanna let you know some uh, 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 facts about how that might play out. One is that I might be in class or I might be um, doing something that I'm not available to pick up the phone. Um, most weekends I am unavailable. I, I leave town and I'm in a location that I don't have cell phone reception, I don't have internet reception. And so from Friday afternoon through, through Monday morning, I'm in most weeks not going to be reachable. Now if you check on this stuff, say on the second day the test is available and you don't plan on taking it to the fifth day, we've got a lot of time to play around with. But if you're hoping to take it that day, 
very often I'm not going to be available to help you fix that problem. I'm happy to help once you've done those steps and you haven't been successful. I'm happy to step in at that point. But um, I will ask you, have you taken those steps? Who have you talked to in the testing centers? So I will have a point of reference to figure out what's going on here. Uh, but if those things haven't been able to work out and I'm available, I'll be glad to assist. Okay, so that's how you take the test in the testing centers. Oh, by the way, other information about the testing centers, if you choose to use that approach, is that you should check the testing center hours. Generally speaking, the testing center hours are pretty open from Monday through Thursday. They are open until about 9 p.m., although check to confirm this. On Fridays, though, they close relatively early in the afternoon, and on Saturdays, uh, they are not open in the evening. On Sundays, they're not open at all, so you need to be aware of when their hours are. Testing centers will not allow you to start a test during the last hour that they're open, so all of those are important things to keep in mind. As always, please don't wait until the last day to take a test. You're setting yourself up for the possibility of problems, and so my suggestion would be to go to contact the testing center on the first or second day if you're taking in a different location, and to go in and get it taken care of. That way, no matter what happens, you're going to be okay. But let's say you're out of town during that week, or maybe you happen to live in a different part of the country, even though you're taking a course at Collin. Um, well, you, uh, the, the, there would be a lot of hassle for you to come all the way to Collin, Collin County into those circumstances. So we have an alternative, and that is ProctorU. ProctorU is an online proctoring service. So you can take the test in the privacy of your own home or hotel room or wherever you might be. Um, so let me kind of explain a little bit about that. If you choose to explore this option in more detail, I'll give you more specifics. Um, so what what do you need to think about in terms of ProctorU? Well, the first thing that you need to be aware of is that ProctorU is a service that you would need to pay for. The cost for ProctorU uh, for each test typically runs from about $10 to about $40, depending upon how long uh, you take to complete the test. Um, that's the first thing to keep in mind, but sometimes, particularly if you're out of town, this obviously is still a good investment. The second thing to keep in mind is that ProctorU requires um, some compatibility features with your computer. And so there is a test that you run to see if your computer is compatible with ProctorU. One thing your computer is going to need to have is a webcam. And we'll go through how you make those tests if you choose to take advantage of this um, opportunity. A third thing that you have to keep in mind is that you need a place, obviously with your computer, that is going to be quiet, that no one else is going to be um, in and out of that particular area. So let's say you've got small children. You will still need to have somebody who's going to be able to take care of them. You won't be able to monitor your small children while you're taking the test of ProctorU. If you've got teenagers, obviously they can uh, uh, watch themselves, so to speak. Um, but um, little children, this isn't an alternative to a babysitter. You'll still need that person to take care of the kids. Um, so those are some things to keep in mind about ProctorU. I'm glad to set it up for you if that's what you want to do, but you do need to let me know 10 days before the test window opens. So if you're thinking that you want to do ProctorU, go ahead and pause right now and send me an email and we can get start that process um, even today. By sending me the email to start it, you're not committing. Most students choose not, once they've explored it, more detail, choose not to use it. But again, there's no harm in exploring that. You can take use ProctorU for one test and not the other test. Um, if you miss the window uh, for the midterm, no worries. You'll just go ahead and take the test at one of our testing centers at Collin, and then you can use the testing center for the uh, final examination. So I talk about the same thing on this slide, so I'm going to keep on going. Um, the class participation is 10% of your grade, and so it is something that is worthy of your consideration. They're probably the 10% points that are easiest to earn, um, but they do involve sticking around and consci conscientiously um, making the posts. So let's talk about some of the things that you need to be aware of with the discussion board. We'll have a discussion board every week. Um, I think maybe we even have two the first week. I'm not sure about that. Um, your, your uh, first post that you'll make on a given discussion board will be a, a, your, your substantive post. It needs to be at least 100 words long. 
and not 100 fluffy words. So it shouldn't be, hi, how you doing? This is what I want to say about this topic. No, cut to the chase. If you're only going to post 100 words, you need to have 100 on point words that are talking about the issue. I mean, if you post 200 or 300 words, which I commonly do see, uh, there can be a little bit of fluff there, but I expect lean and mean if you're only at 100 words. And then you need to end with your word count. If you're under 100 words, you're going to lose points. If you don't post the word count, you're going to lose points. Um, if your uh, substantive post really doesn't respond well to the prompt, you're going to lose points. S every now and again, I know this won't be you, but every now and again I'll have a student who maybe has a post of 80 words, but they say they have 107 words or whatever. Just know that I know I can eyeball and see ones that are under 100 words and then I count them. And if there is a significant difference, I get if there's one or two word difference. But if there's a significant difference between your count and my count, and my count's right, that's an academic dishonesty issue. And so I will have to approach it from that standpoint. I don't want to do that. You don't want me to do that. So don't misrepresent the number of words. If all you can think of is 87 words, then Write your text and list your words as 87 words. Better to tell the truth and lose a point or two than to um, misrepresent it, still lose even more points, and also have an academic dishonesty issue that you have to confront. After you do your substantive post, then you're going to read your other the other a student's posts and pick one to make a response. You can actually do more than one, but you're only required to do one. Your response needs to be at least 50 words. That's usually two or three sentences long, and you'll need to include the word count there. And again, this should be substantive. I don't want to see posts that say, Dear Bob, I really liked your post. It was really interesting. Thanks so much for making the post. Um, you're really smart. Um, I'm glad you're in the class. Blah, blah, blah. That's not a reply post. You need to reply, respond substantively to what they say. You can agree, you can disagree, but you need to say why you agree or why you disagree uh, to earn all of the points that are available. It's not hard to earn these points, but you do need to do the assignment. The due date for the um, discussion boards will always be um, 11.59 p.m. on Sunday, but you'll need to make your uh, first post on a different day. So if you're going to wait to do your reply post on Sunday, you'll need to make your first post at least by Saturday. Don't make both posts on the same day. We need to have two different days because if everyone waits until 11 p.m. to make their first post, then there aren't any posts for anyone to respond to. We've had students be in a pickle in that situation. Someone who's going to be out of town for the weekend, they've made their post well in advance, but nobody's posted something they can re respond to. So be sure to post earlier. You'll see all of the dates are going to, due dates are going to be at 11.59 p.m. on a Sunday. Discussion boards are open. They open uh, first thing on Monday morning and they close um, at late on Sunday evening. So those are going to be the pattern throughout. You'll see the due dates posted on Canvas, but that pattern you'll see in all of the assignments and all of the discussion boards. To begin a discussion board, you're going to just click on the word reply underneath the discussion board prompt. Here are some FAQs that come up. Uh, we're never going to meet together as a class. Come see me during my office hours if you have any questions or things like that. You absolutely can work ahead if you want to take the midterm or the final examination before the time that I've designated. No worries. I'm happy to make it available to you earlier. The only thing you can't really do ahead is the discussion board, but you do have that full week that you can post on that. And um, again, that's something that you could do from a smartphone if you were out of town. Um, um, so that is something to think about. Um, and again, if you have to miss one discussion board, it is not the end of the world by any means. Sometimes people have computer problems. Maybe your computer is on the fritz. Maybe your internet is not reliable. Uh, there is no reason to panic under those circumstances because your tuition 
um, permits you to use the computer labs. There is a computer lab on each one of the three major campuses. And as long as you have a student ID, you can go in and use those facilities. Now, when you're watching the lectures, you will, of course, need your earbuds to go ahead and listen to lecture because as interesting as my lectures are, uh, probably the person next to you doesn't need to hear about that. Um, if you want feedback on your performance, I give a lot of the feedback when I grade assignments and I also give a lot of feedback globally in the announcements that I post. But I'd also be glad to talk with you individually about how you are performing on a particular assignment or more generally in the class. Um, sometimes I get students who want to submit an assignment by email or want to leave an assignment in my office or something like that. I only accept assignments submitted by Canvas. That's another reason that you probably ought not wait until Sunday night to submit it, because what if there's a problem with Canvas? Um, go ahead and uh, go submit your assignment early on. Maybe you're still tweaking it on Sunday. Well, you can always take down what you submitted and resubmit whatever it is that you want. Um, every now and again, I'll get a student who's taken uh, pictures of things and want to send me those pictures. Uh, that's not what I'm looking for from a professional standpoint. I do want to have uh, documents that are professionally prepared. Pictures on your phone aren't going to qualify for that purpose. Handwritten submissions aren't going to qualify for that purpose. So keep that in mind as you uh, submit your documents. Um, if this isn't a style that you would submit to an employer, probably not one you want to submit to your instructor. Here's some good advice about um, how you might want to approach the assignments. I also have a cheat sheet that I'll show you in a few minutes. It gives you a summary of all the things that you'll want to be doing in the class every week. Technical problems. This is slide 35 in this course. You may want to go ahead and take a screenshot of this or take a picture of it on your phone or perhaps even download this whole orientation PowerPoint so you'll have it. The problem, of course, is that this tells you how to solve problems when they come up, but if you um, can't get into Canvas because of a technical problem, you can't get to this document, so it's kind of this catch-22 situation. Uh, let me begin by saying that I am not a technical guru. My technical skills are very limited. I do know how to maneuver fairly well in Canvas, but um, I, I uh, don't uh, don't represent myself to have um, awesome technical skills. So these are some pretty easy s solutions that you may want to consider. If the problem is more serious, you're going to want to go to the experts, the people in the um, e-learning center, or use one of the computer labs at Collin. So um, one thing I guess to start with is a reality check. We all know there's going to be technical problems. Uh, for you to go the whole semester and never have a problem with Canvas, never have a problem with your computer, is not realistic. Um, so be sure to buy yourself some grace, buy yourself some margin by doing assignments well ahead of the due date, doing submissions well before you need to. That way, if there's a problem, you've got some breathing room. Sometimes I cause problems. Um, I'm very, very fallible, as you'll discover. I try my best not to, but sometimes I do cause a problem. And if you think I'm the cause of it, uh, for example, you know there's supposed to be a discussion board, but you can't see it, probably I forgot to hit the right button. Let me know as soon as possible. The quicker I know about it, the quicker I can fix it, and so it's going to be an easier problem to resolve. Um, again, I apologize in advance if I'm causing any of those problems. If it's not me, here are some strategies you may want to think. One is you may want to try a different browser. When I use Canvas, I work from a PC, and some things I do, I like to use Firefox for and some things I like to use Google Chrome for. Um, and so sometimes just switching browsers, even if you have great success with Chrome, uh, you might want to just try Firefox because sometimes an update will hit the computer and some, suddenly things aren't talking to each other in the same way. Another strategy is to reboot your computer. Um, sometimes doing that will clear the cache or whatever's going on and you'll be able to be more successful. A third approach is to use a different computer. You may want to go to the computer lab, or perhaps you have access to a different computer at your home, maybe your roommate's computer, maybe a computer at work. Um, it may be something that's happening to your computer right then, or maybe your internet um, connection isn't what it ought to be. A fourth approach would be to let somebody else see what you're seeing. 
sometimes that obvious thing that they immediately see we can't see I know it's true for me all the time oh yeah I should have clicked on that button it was obvious and yet I didn't see it so um, those are some strategies to think through as you uh, uh, encounter technical difficulties but probably the big takeaway is um, this one give yourself some margin recognize there's going to be problems plan for the worst and hope for the best in other words I know we're going to have a great semester. I'm excited to be your instructor. I hope you have as much fun learning about hospitality law as I do teaching it. Now I'm going to flip and give you a bit of a tour of our Canvas class. So let me go over here. Here is our Canvas class. This should look very similar to what you have when you go into Canvas. You won't have this fuchsia section down here. The first thing you'll see when you go in is that our first module, we're actually in the um, a modules tab right here. The first thing you'll see is start here orientation. Welcome. So this section is what we're going to focus on at first. The sections below are going to be substantive. We're actually working on the meat of the course, the actual instructional material. We see we have module one. I call it module one even though we have the orientation module above. And you'll see module one tracks with chapter one. Module two tracks with chapter two. And as we go through, we'll see, and look, module five tracks with chapter five. And uh, we're gonna continue to track, I don't actually have the chapter numbers here, but week 10 is um, chapter 10, et cetera, et cetera. So we get all the way to week 15. Actually, I don't have anything in week 16. That's the final examination week. Okay, so let's look at the orientation module. The first thing we have is the syllabus. I've actually already downloaded the syllabus, so we have it right here. Um, some things to keep in mind. The first thing is that the last day to drop this course is, let me change that to a different color. The last day to drop this course is going to be October 19th. I certainly hope you won't drop this course, but it's a smart strategy to go ahead and uh, put this in your calendar. Any 16-week course you're taking this semester, this would be the drop date. It's very difficult to drop after this date. Maybe you win the lottery and you don't need to take this course, or um, you get that great job in a different city and this course no longer makes sense for you. Anyway, it's a good idea to have this in the back of your mind, although I certainly hope you don't drop this course. There's a lot of technical stuff that I'm going to sc uh, scroll through. You may want to review this in, at your leisure at a different time. Here's information about me. Um, this is, sorry about that. This is information about my office hours. Um, I have office hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 2 p.m. to 3.10 in my office on the Frisco campus. I also have office hours remotely or virtually on Wednesdays, on Wednesday mornings. And here's information about how to access those. Zoom is the virtual office tool that we use, and it's super, super easy. In fact, I'm using Zoom right now. That's how you're watching me. Um, so the first thing to do is you make this an active link and I'm going to hit control uh, uh, click on my mouse and I'm going to go into zoom I'm not actually going to continue on from here but it's yeah I'm, we're almost there you're we're almost in zoom at this point um, that's how we go that's how you will go about entering you can enter from your using a smartphone your iPhone a computer, a Mac, whatever system you have. It's very user friendly. You can also call me from a landline if you want to. Here are the numbers to call for that purpose. If you have some kind of difficulty reaching me, somehow these systems aren't working, send me an email and I will be able to um, uh, see what the, the issue is and hopefully we can uh, problem solve so that you get the information that you need. I do have an office telephone number and an email address, but I ask that you email me instead of calling me most times. I am not in my office a lot outside of my office hours. I work from home primarily. And so um, if, if you sit, let's say you were to uh, send me a, or call me at 3.30 on Thursday, I might not get your message until Tuesday. If you send me an email on Thursday, I'll probably respond to it by 4. 
um, I'm pretty conscientious about responding to emails. And so you're going to get an answer a lot quicker um, than you will if you send me a voicemail. So that I will appreciate that if you do follow that guidance. Here's information about the textbook. We already talked about this, but if you're looking for various ways that you might purchase it, here is the ISBN number. We've already talked about how the grades are calculated. Here's some general information um, about tests. Here's, here's some information about the quizzes. Let's focus upon this for a second. There will be two quizzes in this course, and each quiz you'll have 30 minutes to complete. I think that there might be 35 questions on each quiz, so it's about a minute per quiz. I provide that because um, Giving you a minute is, because these are true, false, multiple choice questions, is more than enough time for you to answer the question, but not so long that you can look it up, or at least you won't be able to look up many questions. So it's a way to maintain the integrity of the test. Some students, though, would like to have additional time. I completely understand that. When I take tests, I check and recheck my work. I'm very, very careful and I respect that and I want to reward students who happen to approach tests in that way. So I'm glad to make this test available to you untimed in one of the testing centers. And of course I can do that because you won't be able to cheat under those circumstances. So let me know and I'll be glad to assist with that. Um, the midterm and the final examination, you'll have to take in the testing centers anyway, so those will not be timed. Um. Here is the blow-by-blow blow of various due dates. Um, I list, um, for example, the midterms and the quizzes, I list just one day, but there will be a range of days that you can take these tests. So this is the final day most likely. This will be the final day most likely. Um, so don't worry and say, oh, wait a second, I'm going to be out of town on the, on the 7th. That's fine, just so long as you are able to complete the test during the window. And if you can't, let me know and we'll, I'll schedule it so that you can take the test earlier than the window begins. And you'll see I list whether there's an assignment, uh, when the discussion board happens. You'll see most uh, weeks there will be one discussion board. This first one, there's two, but most will have one discussion board and one assignment. Um, so week two, week three, week four. Um, week five, now when we get to week six, you have a discussion board and a quiz, but no assignment. We're back to the older pattern for week seven, week eight, week nine, we have a um, little typo there. Not sure you have to check there to see the date. I'm thinking it's probably the fourth, but double check that to make sure I got it right. Week 10 is the same pattern, 11 and 12, but you'll see here on week 13, we have another quiz. So there's no chapter assignment that week. There is still a discussion board. Week 14, there's a discussion board, but no quiz, no test, and no assignment. Um, that, I do that because we're getting close to the end of the year. Um, and I want to uh, give you a little bit more time to prepare for the final. And then this last uh, regular week, there will be discussion board, but no assignment. Um, and then finally, we'll have the final examination. The final examination is cumulative, so it'll cover everything we've done, but obviously it's going to focus on the chapters that happened after the midterm and especially after quiz two. So uh, you'll see uh, I provide the breakdown of questions in the uh, test information. So it'll help you focus your um, efforts. So we've gone through the syllabus. Let's click on here to the welcome letter. This gives you some information about me, gives you some suggestions about how to approach. I kind of repeat some stuff I've already said, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I talk about ProctorU, I talked about different tools you can use to um, uh, learn more about how to use a Canvas. 
also remind you this is not self-paced, but you do need to follow the due dates. Here's my contact information. It's also on the syllabus. Here's the orientation that we've already covered, so I'm just going to keep on flipping through that. Here's lots of useful tools for you as a, as a student, uh, various programs. Some of these won't necessarily apply to this course, but they might apply to other courses that you're taking. Here's a way to check your system to make sure that you have what you need in order to be successful in Canvas. If you have any troubles, this is a smart approach to use. Of course, you can always use the computer lab. I have a practice assignment submission. You don't have to do this. This is not for any type of points or any type of credit. As you can say, I say, this assignment does not count toward the final grade. But some of them students are concerned, well, gosh, I don't know how to submit on Canvas. What if I'm submitting Sunday night and I can't figure out which button to hit? That's causing me some stress. I don't want you to be stressed about that. You can test the system by submitting here. So I'm just going to give you an example about how you submit. So let's just say, pretend this is a real assignment that I've, I've gone ahead and prepared. I'm now ready to submit. So what I do is I click on this button here that says submit. I click on this. Now I'm going to have to choose my file. So I'm going to go into my computer. I'm just going to pick actually the syllabus. But I could go through any folder that I have, but I have the syllabus here. So I'm going to click on that. I can see the document that I clicked on right here. I'm going to hit open. I see the name of the document here. I could click another file if I wanted to. So I'm going to go ahead and click another syllabus. I can see the name of the syllabus here. I click open and I can see the name here. I can go on and click as many as I want to. I can include a note to the instructor. Um, Dear Professor Grover, um, I have submitted my assignment. Thank you, Bob, student. Okay, now I'm going to hit submit. That's gone away and I can see what I submitted. Let's say I'm concerned that I posted the wrong thing. Well, I can check the names here, but let's say I don't know the name of it. I can click on this and download whatever it is I posted. Let's say I look at that and go, that's not what I wanted to submit. So now I'm going to go back and I'm going to resubmit the assignment because I didn't mean to post this one. Of course, I would check this one too. So I'm going to do resubmit. Um, I am going to choose this folder this time. So I'm going to hit open and I'm going to hit submit assignment. So now I have what I really wanted. If I, when I hit resubmit, whatever I've already submitted is going to go away. Um, so if I wanted to have this document and another document, I'm going to have to go back and resubmit this document, which is the same thing I have over here. See, it's the right document hit. And then I can add, we'll say, I want to add, we'll go back to our original syllabus. Right here's the name, I hit open, I hit submit, and now I'm good. Sometimes it's a, it, you may want to resubmit because you hit the wrong button and you selected the wrong document, or you may make changes to it. You did the assignment earlier, maybe you submitted on Wednesday, but you start thinking about the assignment, you think, gosh, I, I think I can add something to it or make it a little bit better, or I've changed my mind about one of the answers. No worries, just go ahead and resubmit your corrected version. Again, you don't have to do this. If you feel confident about a Canvas, then there's no need to. It's not for a grade. And um, we've gone ahead to our first module, so I'm going to go back to our list here. So we've completed the orientation materials, and now we're going to look at a module. I'm going to not pick the first one. I'm going to go down here. We'll look at module three. Okay, you'll see that I have three lectures in this one. Um, and so obviously you're going to watch them in order. You're going to want to take careful notes, obviously, as you go through it. How do you access the lecture? Well, you click on this button. And then you just click on this button. I'll play it for just a second. Pull up 
pause it and go back. Each one of the lectures, what, what you'll see is the same type of thing you see in this one. You'll see typically the PowerPoint or whatever I click to and you'll hear my voice. So we have those three lectures. I suggest after you've read the textbook that you, re that you watch the lectures and you can see that you have access to the PowerPoint, the same one that I'm using in class. You may want to download that. There's really no reason to write out in your notes the same information that's on the PowerPoint. Um, and so you'll have that available uh, for note taking for review purposes. Um, I write my own PowerPoint, so this won't be exactly the same material that is in the textbook. Sometimes I supplement it or organize it in a different way. Um, Ah, here we go. So we have, in this case, 47 slides. So we go through various slides here. So you'll want to look at the PowerPoint, obviously. And um, I actually say read chapter three here. You may want to read it before you watch the lecture. That's, I guess, an individual choice. And then you see you have your discussion board post for chapter three. You'll see here the due date. Now this is going to be that Sunday date, so you'll want to make your substantive post by at least September 15th, ideally before that. It looks like I'm using five points now. I think in some of my communications I say 10 points, but obviously five out of five is the same as 10 out of 10, so it works the same way. It's just I scaled it down a little bit. Let's just click on this so you can see what a discussion board looks like. Ah, I've locked it. So let me go ahead and leave student view so I can turn it on. And you'll see there will be a lot of times a video to watch or a scenario to keep in mind. Um, here, I, as you, and just a reminder, you want to make your substantive, your first post by noon on Saturday. I try to repeat the rules about what needs to be in a discussion board. I'm not sure I do it every time, but this is a, another handy place to look for it. So let's say you've read it, you've looked at the video, you're ready to go ahead and make your post. All you do is click on this reply button and you'll have room to make your post. Okay, I'm gonna go back to student launch. And the last thing that we'll have in a module is going to be, most modules, is going to be the assignment. So let's click on the assignment. And you'll see um, I, uh, um, I say attach a blank form of um, the Texas Certificate of Formation for a Limited Liability Company. I explain where you can get it, and then you need to answer these six questions. And you can get these answers off of the form itself. And um, your responses should be in complete grammatically correct sentences. This is really important because what we're trying to do is to develop your confidence level so you can communicate with that future employer, that boss, that guest, that employee. And obviously you're gonna to wanna to do it in complete grammatically correct sentences. And so um, be sure, one good way to make sure your sentences meet the standard is to put it in Microsoft Word and do a check of the grammar with respect to that. Um, if you don't have access to Microsoft Word on your home computer, you can go to the computer lab to work on it. Um, if you see that I'm taking deductions for this standard not being met, come and see me during my office hours. Bring your assignment uh, for the next submission and you and I will clean it up and make it grammatically correct. Uh, you ought to number your answer. So you ought to say number one, and your answer ought to include the question. It should not restate the question, but it ought to include the question. Let me give you an example. In this, this first question is, are Texas LLC subject to a state franchise tax? Let's assume that the answer is yes. So your answer might be, Texas LLCs are subject to a state franchise tax, period. Let's say the answer is no. Well, then you would say Texas LLCs are not subject to a state franchise tax. So your answer should um, include the question. The reader should not have to have read the question to be able to understand your response. Your response to all six of these questions should be at least 
100 um, words long. That's going to be quite easy to do because you can see you're going to need at least six sentences. And so typically a sentence is going to be 20 to 25 words most likely. So you're going to be comfortably above 100 words. Um, if you're below 100 words, you probably don't have complete sentences up here. You will need to include your word count. If you forget, you're going to lose a point. So, and also keep in mind, I don't submit, I don't accept late homework. So again, you're going to hit this submit button and do those things that we talked about before. Let me go back to modules and I'll show you the quizzes. Okay, here we have quiz number one. That for the first quiz is in module six. You can see I have the due date here. You're going to click on this and you will complete the assignment. I'll make this here. You'll see, you'll see that you can only have one attempt. You'll have 30 minutes to do it. There will be two parts. There'll be 35 questions. So you'll have almost a minute per question. You can't do the quiz over multiple settings. You can't save it and then return to it. Once you answer a question, you can't backtrack. And so you have to be confident of your answer before you move forward. Um, this will be similar to the quiz number two setup as well as the midterm and the final examination. Here's where you'll find announcements. Of course, we don't have any yet because the course hasn't begun. I have some that I've programmed in that I'll be showing you over the year. And then, of course, you'll find your grades under the grade to tab. Um, at this point, I think that we've covered what we need to. I'm really looking forward to this semester. I'm really interested in learning more hospitality law along with you. I thank you for your time and your attention, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.